Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this fifth series out of eight of our National Philanthropy Scan. And thank you for joining us here today. We are the representatives from the Patterson Foundation. We're here to present along with some great experts in the presentation field under telehealth, our digital access and telehealth. Today, we're gonna to talk about what's working, what are the challenges and what are the opportunities? My name's Sherry Corrier. I'm the Digital Access for All Initiative Lead for the Patterson Foundation. And today's event is also co-hosted with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. As we move on to our next slide, just a few things to cover for today while we get ready and sit back to listen to these wonderful presenters. Again, feel free to right now introduce yourself in the chat box, your name, your organization, and your role. Rename yourself on your screen with your name and your organization. It's really helpful for us to know who you're here representing. Please mute yourself throughout the um, presentation when you're not speaking. You can use the chat box to comment and ask questions at any time. Our wonderful digital access for all team is monitoring those and so are your presenters. You can always raise your hand digitally, of course, when we're in our Q&A, if you have any questions. We will be recording this session. However, it is off the record. We want you to share openly when we move to our breakout sessions. That's what those are all about. We have people that are helping to facilitate those and we'll be trying to move those along so that everyone in this session has an opportunity to speak. Also on the screen here, you can see where you can join our conversation on Twitter using these hashtags in conjunction with digital access and the campaign for grade level reading nationally. And we'd love to have you join us for future workshops and you'll have an opportunity to do that at the end of today's program by signing up for next, the next session number five. Moving on, I just wanna tell a little bit about the group about the Patterson Foundation and our role in strengthening all of those around us. And the Patterson Foundation's efforts, strengthening all the efforts of people, organization and communities is especially important that we focus wide participation in trying to connect people together. And that's what you're gonna find out from today's presentation. In our next slide, I just wanna take an opportunity here to recognize our presenters today. And our presenters um, will be spending a great deal of time talking about their efforts as well as working along with the subject. So today we have Hannah Wesolowski, who is the Chief Advocacy Officer at NAMI USA. And um, Hannah comes from all the way from New Hampshire in her early beginnings to 2017 at NAMI. She has decades of experience and we've provided all of these bios in depth as a pre-reading and also will be in our follow-up. Next joining us today is Michael Tipton, the CEO of Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana's Foundation. Michael's been with them since 2015. And when you read his bio, we want you to read more about how he went from teaching high school history in the South Bronx to returning to his home state of Louisiana to where he is today. Our next, our last and presenter is Vanith, Vanith Aignar. And Vanith is the executive director for the state of Louisiana's broadband efforts. It's also known as Connect LA. And Vanith has a long history of working in this space and some other interesting facts about him. If you read his bio, our Vanith received the Johns Hopkins University Woodrow Wilson Distinguished Alumni Award for Public Service in 2022 and a number of other awards you can see in his bio. So with that, we're very excited to have this great set of presenters. And I'd like to introduce to you, next on our screen is Michael Zimmerman from the Patterson Foundation. Michael is our National Initiative Development Lead and Michael, has completed the National Philanthropy Scan, which has led us to these workshop series. And Michael, I'm gonna turn it over to you for more in depth. Thank you so much, Sherry. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're thrilled you can be here. 
um, and a little bit more about what Sherry mentioned. So why did the Patterson Foundation go on this journey to figure out, well, what's working where and why and how and who is invested in this when it comes to digital access, equity and inclusion? And so we went on a, an exploration. We interviewed funders from around the country who were invested domestically, invested internationally, and we asked them, what have been the challenges? What have been the opportunities? What's been working? Why haven't you invested in digital access? What are the obstacles that are preventing that from happening? And we learned a lot. We learned a lot. That resulted in us compiling a national philanthropy scan report that actually highlights all those prevailing themes that we learned during those 40 plus interviews with funders and CSR departments um, uh, and corporate giving around the country. So um, we are thrilled and delighted to share that report with you here on this uh, workshop because uh, part of our mission here at the Panos Foundation is to strengthen people, organizations, and communities. And we can do just that by making sure that we can uh, foster a space for knowledge sharing. And so the report is in the chat if you'd like to click on it and learn a little more about what are funders wrestling with around the country as far as digital access and where is it working and maybe there is something for you to learn there or um, people with whom you can connect as you figure out how you're gonna navigate your next steps with your digital access endeavors. Um, in addition to that, or on the heels of that report rather, uh, we thought about how can we highlight some of the prevailing themes and bring it to life and bring it into uh, a, a, a sphere where uh, people can talk about this and discuss it and learn from each other. And so the result of this report was the digital, um, this digital access funder workshop series. We're thrilled to be doing it in partnership with the campaign, the, the campaign for grade level reading. And uh, they are our partner in this. And we're thrilled to have with us the three panelists who you will see on the screen shortly here to talk a little more about um, how we are going to explore the opportunities and challenges and what's working uh, when it comes to telehealth um, at the intersection of digital access. So with that in mind, let's actually jump right in. We're here to explore this important intersection, right? On the heels, we knew digital access and healthcare has been present prior to the pandemic, but gosh, did the pandemic, I mean, people looked online where they had access to do so to find, uh, you know, to address healthcare needs and telehealth exploded. And so uh, we wanna unearth what's working now. Here we are um, three years later into this, and, um, and, and many years later in, uh, since the inception of uh, uh, telehealth. And so we're joined by uh, Benith Iyengar. Benith, as you know, is the executive director of Connect Louisiana. And Benith, let's jump right into the what's working, what are the challenges, and, and frankly, what are the opportunities in Louisiana and around the country, Benith? Yeah, thank you, Michael, and thank you for really the team uh, Patterson Foundation for for uh, having me participate, especially on our panel, especially in this year, how how relevant this is when it comes to the digital divide that we're trying to solve. But let me sort of har harken you back, and Michael started to touch on it a little bit before the pandemic um, really started. You know, if you think about, and if you were to survey people before 2019, at least in Louisiana, before 2020 rather, in Louisiana what the number one, two, and three challenge was in rural parts of the state of Louisiana, they would often say it's broadband. They would often say it's broadband is number one, two, and three. And so you had that societal disconnect between folks that lived in rural rural areas in Louisiana, and it's going to be really the, the same principles and applications throughout the country. But you had people in the rural areas before the pandemic that would raise their hand and say, it's, it's a big issue. Pandemic hits in 20. And what what did you see? What did you feel? And what did you hear from folks in terms of their broadband challenges, which elevated suddenly the rural challenge to a much heightened and greater sense of, 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 of awareness? 
And that was singularly because the cha broadband challenge now equally affected people that lived in urban areas. So you had a shared- You know what, let's go outside. You had a shared societal issue, which is broadband being an accessible thing in both rural and to a certain degree in urban areas, urban areas. It became an affordability issue. It became a digital skilling issue and it became a device issue. And so in Louisiana, if you were to take four families that lived, well, let's say white, black, rich, poor, urban, rural, and you bring them all to a room and you bring them all and you say, let's talk about broadband, you're going to have everyone's hands say effectively the same thing. I either can't afford it. I don't understand it. I don't have access to it. And I don't have a physical device on which to use broadband. And what was then an issue was how it was impacting healthcare, how it was impacting a small business owner, how it was impacting parent teacher. And I think everyone on this, on this call, I guarantee you has had a broadband story that they can share both professionally and personally that they can share, especially in terms of it's, when you talk about broadband, the visceral reactions people have it. And oftentimes the visceral reactions is I'm overpaying for something that's subpar and mediocre. So as a result of this downward pressure, really it was upward pressure from both rural and folks that lived in urban areas across a variety of sectors. It came up and through the infrastructure bill, this, this, not only the state of Louisiana, but the country is making the largest investment to addressing the digital divide in the history of the country, more so, more so uh, than perhaps rural electrification or the equivocation to rural electrification uh, decades and decades and, and generations ago. So let's talk about what that effectively means. So the infrastructure bill passes in November 2021, uh, 65 billion will be spent to addressing the digital divide. And where it becomes really interesting is that 42 and a half of that 60, 65 billion will be diffused through state offices like ours. Our challenge in Louisiana is this. We have 1.7 million people in Louisiana, so almost one out of every three folks in the state that do not have internet because of one of those four issues I mentioned, access, affordability, literacy, and skills. And when we think about the 1.7 million, 42 percent of those are either African-American and Latino households. So it disproportionately affects a population that makes up 38% of the state's population. So that's the macro problem statement that we're trying to solve for. And as we start to dive deeper and you start to look at the concentric circles, there's gonna be 460,000, we think there are approximately 460,000 of that 1.7 that lack basic digital skills. Basic, basic computer skills. You know, everyone at Google and Apple and Facebook are talking about coding as the next big career. I mean, it's always been a big career, but the next even bigger career. But we're talking about someone's inability to turn on the computer, go to CVS or go to Google or or to or go to my charts and to facilitate a telehealth visit. We're talking about someone's inability to fill out a resume online because they just don't know how. And so in Louisiana, we have approximately 460,000 people, 460,000 people between 18 and 64 that lack digital skills. We have almost 800,000 people that can't afford it. And we've been pushing out pretty aggressively the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission's Affordable Connectivity Program, in which we've had nearly 400,000 households in Louisiana benefit as a product of the, of the infrastructure bill um, receiving $30 a month off their broadband bills. And on a per capita basis, we're, we're, we're actually doing really well in terms of adoption of that program, I think number one in the country. You've got almost 400,000 households in Louisiana that are unserved and underserved. And then the balance, you know, to not have de devices. So that's the challenge that we have at a macro level. And so Look, our, singularly, and I'm, I'm going to be flippant, I mean, our job is to eliminate the digital divide, right? And to do it by 2029. 
The fortunate thing is that we're going to have tremendous amount of federal resources to do it. And so we think we, we feel really confident with the allocation that we're going to receive from the infrastructure bill on top of what we receive from, from the American Rescue Plan, on top of a program that's already coming through the Federal Communications Commission that we'll have enough money to solve the problem. The key challenge from our perspective is we'll, we'll solve the functional needs to ensure that every single household gets what they need, which is access to high-speed, affordable, reliable internet. So the days of throttling, the days of data capture are going to be no longer. The days of trying to call your service provider and say, hey, I need something that's really important. And they say, well, I can't get it to you because it's going to be too cost prohibitive. It's not going to happen, right? Those days are going to be done. Now, it's going to take several years because of the size of the problem, but it's going to be done. The key from our perspective, Michael, is how do we then leverage broadband as a platform, as an asset, and as an enabler? And this is really important to all the folks that are listening, right? to drive the kinds of healthcare outcomes that we truly want to achieve in Louisiana. How do we leverage broadband as an asset platform enabler to start getting folks that historically would not be in a position to get jobs in the construction maintenance and, 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 the, and the build out of these networks to get the kind of got jobs that where they can build careers locally? How do we leverage all of these networks to drive down operating expenses for farmers and so on and so forth. And so that's that's what gets us excited. And what we're doing actively right now and over the next couple of months is we're putting together two different plans for the state of Louisiana. We're putting together the state's first digital equity plan in the state. We've never done that before. And so we're doing a tremendous amount of stakeholder engagement. We're doing a ton, a, a, a ton of we're having numerous conversations with what we consider covered populations, people who are disabled that have been summarily impacted by the lack of broadband, uh, people where English is not the primary language, folks that were formerly incarcerated, um, you know, uh, obviously folks where, where the challenge around broadband has is especially heightened. So we're putting together the first digital equity plan, which will make available for public review and public comments over the next four to six weeks. And on the, on the same side, we're putting together state's first large five-year investment plan, right? So with all of these federal dollars that are coming in, you know, how are we gonna spend that money? Where are we gonna spend that money? In which um, thematic areas will we dedicate some of those dollars? And from our perspective, tele well, healthcare broadly speaking is a very important thematic area that we're gonna address some of the challenges. So. So Michael, I'm going to stop there because I probably gave you more than enough, but that hopefully that gives you a snapshot of how we're trying to address this. Pradeep, that was quite helpful. And I can certainly say uh, what it comes back to, uh, to, to reiterate what you, you brought up to um, everyone here, uh, it comes back to the literacy component, the connectivity component and the access component and deciding, again, the funders thinking through the, so where do we go first or how do we do this all at the same time? or you know, what does that look like for us? Who are our strategic partners? And so, um, but again, the literacy connectivity and access, uh, particularly literacy um, in the, okay, now, right? Infrastructure bill comes forth and uh, folks have the devices, uh, but do they have the skills to use them and use them effectively to participate in society and benefit? Um, yeah, and, and what I've said, Michael, and I've said this publicly, look, it's going to be a busted investment when we invest in all this infrastructure if people fundamentally still do not know how to use it to better their lives, both professionally and personally. I mean, then then what's the whole point of doing this thing? Yeah, I mean, sure, we've checked off the box and people have access to something they've never had. But if they fundamentally, and this is where it becomes really difficult, is that in Louisiana, it, just like most every state, okay, just like every state, not most every state, in the territories, we have 64 parishes in Louisiana, 64 counties, parishes. It's summarily a different issue in every parish, the sizing of this problem. In certain parishes, it's going to be a large digital skills issue. I We live in East Baton Rouge Parish, Michael and I, in East, East Baton Rouge Parish, where Baton Rouge is the, the biggest uh, city, town. 
Um, it's a really a digital skills issue and it's an affordability issue. It's less of an access issue. In East Carroll Parish, which is I think the poorest parish in, in the state, if not one of the poorest in the country, which is on the border of, of um, Arkansas and Mississippi, it's an all of the above problem. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to solve for. Yeah, thank you, Benith. Um, and, and you know, I, I want to, and okay, so let's actually, because I want to invite the perspective of Michael Tipton, who is also joining us here as a panelist, uh, CEO of the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana Foundation. Michael, please, um, uh, we'd love to hear your perspective on what's working and what are the challenges, um, uh, what are the opportunities in Louisiana and beyond, and maybe you could even provide some examples of work that addresses telehealth needs and bridges the digital divide. Michael. Sure. Uh, well, first off, thank you for having me. Uh, and I'll apologize uh, if you hear wonderful background band music. Uh, we're having a crawfish boil here at Blue Cross. So uh, I, I love you all so much that I'm passing up crawfish uh, to be here with you all. So that, that's the background noise. Um, you know, at the Blue Cross Foundation, we're a health focused grant maker. We make grants to improve the wellness and well-being of the people of Louisiana. And while to this crowd, it is probably self-evident that there is a connection between broadband and health, uh, it has not always been to our folks and, and to others. Um, and so the first thing I would say, and then I'll get into some examples, um, I'm very glad that, that Vanith uh, is here and was able to present because one of the things that I think it is critical for philanthropy to understand about this current moment is while you all may have been working on this issue some set of decades uh, ago or some set of years ago, um, you know, when, when Michael Zimmerman and I were talking, uh, when we talked about who are the biggest funders on this issue, I said, well, look, if we don't have a state perspective, we're really missing out because given the infrastructure investments that have come in the last couple of years, the biggest funder of these sets of issues are states, well, federal government into state. And so as a philanthropist, as a philanthropic leader, one of my first uh, points of encouragement to all of us on this issue would be to make sure your state has a team, has a plan, has thoughts about how to address and leverage the resources that are available in their community, and it's being led thoughtfully. Um, you know, I, I put Vanith and his team up against pretty much anybody in the country. I think they're doing an exceptional job. Uh, based on the number of uh, states that call them, I think that's probably evidenced uh, uh, in their experience too, but uh, I would certainly encourage uh, folks in that direction. So, so to step back though, uh, outside of that point, I'd say, you know, to what Vanith said, to what we all said, you know, the issues of broadband speak to questions of access. Do you have the high-speed internet that you need? Can you afford it? Um, do you know enough how to use it? Do you have the education? Do you have the devices, the tools, et cetera? And, and I think there's a role in each of those places that philanthropy can and maybe should play. But I think it's also very important for us to step into that space from a standpoint of saying, where can we add unique value? Where, where are there already partners doing the work? Where can we make programs that already exist more effective? How can we help build upon it or, or fill in a gap? Uh, or frankly, as Vanith and I have talked about over time, just do things that it might be complicated for government or other entities to do or do it faster or do it differently. And so, you know, that's the approach we've tried to take to this is saying we certainly don't have the scale of resources uh, that that the state or federal government may have, but we can do things differently and powerfully. And we think uh, that's a good thing. We can also push on ideas or innovative approaches that maybe the risk tolerance um, isn't uh, isn't where it needs to be to make a public investment, but philanthropy can play a role uh, in investing in unique and in nimble ways. So I'll give two examples that that we are involved with and we think may be helpful for other people. Um, so Vanith talked about how uh, in Louisiana we're in the process of sort of building up the infrastructure to get high speed internet to most places. Um, there are places that currently do not have high speed internet. Um, and we'll be on the end of that delivery spectrum. So we're talking five, 10, X number of years down the road. And then there are the really rural pockets that will be the last of the last to, to get to. Um, there's a little known feature, at least in Louisiana, and this is true in most states, uh, most municipal buildings, specifically libraries, um, are wired for high-speed internet. Uh, and even in the midst of the most rural places where you cannot get good broadband, those public buildings very frequently have a very high quality signal. 
And while we learned this during the pandemic, that that can become uh, a lifeblood of people checking into those resources, there's all sorts of ways to say, you know, the public access to high-speed broadband is going to take some time. So how do we take advantage of that node of high quality um, to get people what they need? So we've started offering grants to <clears throat> local libraries to say, look, could you set up a telehealth station in your library? Um, you know, make it a space that somebody can come in and do a doctor's visit. That's one way to go. Could you put a public facing Wi-Fi uh, feature on the outside of your building and make it so that somebody can drive up 24 hours a day and pull up that iPhone that they have, but they don't have strong enough internet and do a telehealth visit that way? Um, could you recognize that you actually have both those things already, but you don't have a budget to advertise? So printing out flyers and putting them door to door saying, by the way, did you know this is a resource that your local library can help you with? Or renting out devices or take your pick. Um, there are lots of ways that those local hubs like libraries can be powerful. And we want to try and unleash their entrepreneurial spirit, the entrepreneurial spirit of communities by making some relatively small dollar investments uh, open and accessible to them. Most of what I just described, like even that telehealth station, we're talking a couple thousand dollars. This is not a particularly expensive thing. Um, you know, the, the public facing Wi-Fi, we're talking hundreds of dollars. Uh, our printing stuff, you know, frankly, we could probably do it in kind printing. So there's lots of different ways to think about that. Second thing I would encourage folks to think about is telehealth or healthcare access via broadband still requires a human on the other side. So if we look into the current moment in America where we're dealing with uh, a mental health uh, human capital issue, where we're dealing with a, a direct uh, healthcare provider uh, issue, uh, we don't have the nurses we need, we don't have the doctors we need, we don't have the counselors and social workers we need. Um, and so we both need to train more of those people and we'll set aside, there's actually some great broadband or, or tele-access aspects to that, uh, but there's ways to take advantage of the fact that many rural parts of our state uh, might have high-speed broadband, uh, but if they want to go see a counselor or a nurse, um, you know, that person might be an hour away. Uh, and, and so making it such that there are creative ways to open up doors uh, of who can see those patients uh, effectively. Uh, in many states, healthcare is still a single state licensing arrangement. So if you want to become a nurse in a state, you have to check in with that local licensing board. You want to become a counselor in that state, you have to check in with that local board. Uh, we are working with um, the Louisiana State Counseling Board, but also about 20 other states on creating multi-state licensing or a multi-state compact that could allow a mental health counselor in Mississippi or Arkansas or Indiana to see a patient in Louisiana and vice versa, uh, which the more people our people have access to, the more likely they are to be able to get the care that they need once they have that device in their hand, once they have the Wi-Fi that they need. So I, I think those are two lanes where we've tried to sort of uniquely step in and solve uh, or begin solving for a problem, um, but there are dozens of others we could explore as well. Thank you, Michael. And indeed there are, and I, and. It, I want to particularly hit on you brought up mental health, and that actually lends itself to um, who I'm about to invite uh, to speak and, and share their perspective on this. Um, before I do so, I want to invite everyone to turn on their cameras because we're going to be going into breakout rooms right after this point. So please turn on your cameras. We'll be moving into the interactive part of this. Uh, but before we do breakout rooms, I want to talk about NAMI. NAMI, N A M I, provides advocacy, education, support, and public awareness so that all individuals and families affected by mental illness can build better lives, right? That is the mission of NAMI. And Hannah Wisolowski, who's joining us here, is the Chief Advocacy Author Officer with NAMI National. Hannah, thank you for being here. Uh, please share with us what are the challenges and opportunities for NAMI at the intersection of telehealth and digital access. Anna. Yeah, thanks so much, Michael, and pleasure to be with all of you. So NAMI is a national alliance. I work at the national office, but we have over 600 local affiliates across the country, um, and they provide support and education to uh, anyone who's uh, struggling personally with their mental health or family members and loved ones of individuals with mental health conditions. And the pandemic has certainly changed mental health care, both increasing the demand for it, um, but also telehealth has been 
in many uh, aspects a bright spot of the pandemic for, for mental health services. About 160 million Americans live in a mental health provider shortage area. So you think about the overall population of the country, that's a, almost half of, of all Americans live in a mental health provider shortage area. And Michael Tipton was just uh, talking about this, but you can have uh, you know broadband, but if you don't have a provider on the other end, you're still not getting that care. Um, what we've seen through the pandemic is at the height, about 40% of all mental health visits were done via telehealth. Um, and that was about 10 to 15% for other types of healthcare uh, via telehealth. Some of those numbers for other types of care have leveled off and are about five, five to 10%, depending on the specialty, but we're still seeing about 35 to 40% of mental health visits are via telehealth. Um, and this has been a, a great asset for people in rural and frontier areas who have never had access to mental health professionals, who've had to drive hours to get any help uh, to be able to access that care. But a lot of the flexibilities that were put into place for insurance coverage for telehealth are temporary. Some of them have been extended, um, uh, but not all of them have been put in place permanently. So that's a real challenge in terms of making sure this, uh, this uh, opportunity continues to be available to people to access their mental health services. Um, you know, some of the areas that have been really interesting when we think about telehealth are also for kids. The country is in the midst of a youth mental health crisis. The Surgeon General has issued a warning about it. Um, pediatricians, Children's Hospital Association, and Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, um, uh, you know, issued a, a, an alarm bell about a year ago about the children's mental health crisis. And what we're seeing is that kids in schools, schools are where kids are, connecting them to mental health providers via telehealth within the school setting has been an incredible asset to addressing the youth mental health crisis. So increasing access via schools uh, to connect to other community mental health providers that may not be available in the school setting, but that can be connected via the school um, has been really important in addressing um, uh, unique needs of kids during this mental health crisis. Um, you know, some of the other things that we, you know, we continue to watch very closely, you know, some of those insurance um, flexibilities that came about during the pandemic for telehealth include having to have a, um, an in-person appointment with a provider before you can access telehealth. Now that's been waived during the pandemic and that's now been extended through the end of 2024 in Medicare. Um, but that's something that certainly dilutes the impact of telehealth and, and improving access via digital um, means when we require an in-person visit before you can talk to a provider via telehealth. So that's something at least, you know, talking about interstate compacts like Michael was uh, speaking to a moment ago, we see that as a huge asset of really meeting the demand, um, reducing need for transportation, um, and, and some other things that are challenges in, in, in accessing mental health care. But if you continue to have some of these antiquated requirements, uh, and if we revert back to those, that'll be a challenge in people being able to use technology to access um, their healthcare needs. Anna, thank you. Thank you so much. What valuable perspective. We're going to now jump right into breaker rooms on the heels of this very discussion um, because we want each of you to have a chance to explore this further. And so at this point, um, I want to share that when you registered, you submitted to us the questions that you'd like to explore in the breakout rooms with our panelists uh, and with each other. There was an overwhelming response in favor of discussing the very theme of this funder workshop. What are the challenges and opportunities for digital access and telehealth or healthcare at large in your communities? And what roles can funders play in addressing the needs? So we'll be moving everyone into breakout rooms right now. So please turn on your cameras, unmute, and join your breakout rooms. Thank you so much, and we'll see you back here shortly. Um, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I know, too short, too sweet. Uh, so much to discuss, and, um, and we're going to do just that now. Um, at this point, we're going to hear some shout-outs from breakout room one, uh, Rachel Hedinger, uh, fellow at the Patterson Foundation, uh, could you um, guide us through what was discussed in your breakout room? 
Yeah, and in breakout room one, we 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 reinstated the opportunity that funders have and the challenges and opportunities <clears throat> for telehealth. Um, with the amount of federal money that there is to address the structural affordability device access, um, that's that's a huge opportunity. And there's nothing preventing schools from giving kids devices, nothing preventing hotspots in every household. So philanthropy has the power here to fill in those spaces and gaps. And it shouldn't be the only thing, but it definitely can become a leader. Um, other people in Breakout Room 1 talked about some things that they're doing, such as providing literacy programs to students who use iPads, that low-cost access to families, um, trying to help low-income families access laptops, and um, along with that, doing digital literacy and education on how to use those devices. Um, another big thing that came up for our group was using those devices and having that training in their preferred languages. Multiple languages has become increasingly important, and the awareness for that is growing. So that was a big thing, too. Another opportunity that was brought up is maybe having a refurbisher recycling program for devices to be donated to, refurbished, and sent back out into the community. Um, so that's been great. Um, and something that I found interesting was public libraries being brought up. Um, locally, they partnered with tutoring students, training in di digital literacy intergenerationally. Um, which is really cool and I'm glad other communities are making great use of their libraries. Um, we did make it to the second question on the roles that funders can play in addressing the needs. Um, we reinstated that they can do a couple things better and being nimble with their grant sizes and the speed of their grants, taking risk in, in, that, in those decisions to try things in new ways, um, and mixing that public funding with private philanthropy because that's usually goes smoothly and it's a unique possibility um, and responsibility to draw attention to these issues. Um, we also talked about um, partnerships. That's a unique opportunity for funders to figure out who else cares about this issue, what else is going on, and you know, convening those people in a safe space where they can talk to each other in order to figure out how can we partner, how can we collaborate, um, so we discussed that even more funding just to build partnership with community members to listen to the community and their needs. Um, and then we really got to talking about what people are doing there to collaborate with the community when we ran out of time. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and we're going to go out of order here. Um, I'm actually going to share some takeaways from breakout room four. Uh, let me go ahead and share screen. One moment. There we go. And so, uh, can everyone see? Break go, room four. Okay, excellent. So um, here we talked about um, of also the challenges and opportunities for telehealth. It was brought up that um, you know the the opportunity to look at um, access to devices and try to focus on digital navigators would play a particularly important role in making sure that, well, while we're, we might be funding devices to the community and getting devices in the hands of people who don't have them, um, will they have the digital, li digital literacy skills, there it is, um, to be able to use those devices effectively and, um, and be able to use resources that might be at the fingertips of many who um, have learned this. And, and for them, it might be, uh, a learning curve, and we want to ensure that that's not a gap that persists and perpetuates into the future. Um, so digital navigators will play a critical role um, in, in and, and partnering with those organizations that uh, have the capacity to train digital navigators on their team to reach further into the community and further into populations of need. Um, there was also a focus on collective um, impact um, and particularly in Miami-Dade County, uh, Xavier, who works with the Miami Foundation, was able to share perspective on, um, you know, how do we um, look at inclusivity in terms of digital access and ensure that, um, you know, there's a, a greater focus on, well, who, you know, who are we serving? Why are we serving them? How are they being served? And what, is, um, what does this look like to be effective? 
at um, addressing those needs of our population and being and having a keen awareness to the evolving needs because they do change. Um, Xavier also brought up community centers and suggested as a place to offer internet. Um, as Michael Tipton had mentioned, um, uh, internet access at libraries, uh, perhaps uh, the African American Cultural Arts Center, which is now partnered with uh, Hewlett Packard HP and installed a tech lab in the state space, maybe it's also community centers like these that can um, make sure that people can either drive to or get transportation to these parking lots or, or inside these centers and access telehealth from there um, or, access, or just have access to the internet there. Um, perhaps it's also a place for digital navigation training um, or even a place where devices can um, be accessed or people in the community know if they need a device, come here. Um, Monica Gonzalez um, added to that, sharing how um, where she works with Methodist Healthcare, which supports over 75 counties in Texas, has um, supported capital projects, particularly infrastructure. And the importance of funding devices uh, in these areas, because when uh, push comes to shove, if our if populations that are in need do not have the devices and do not have the means to access internet, well, there in there lies the problem as well. Um, they need the device to be able to access all these wonderful resources. So um, uh, hats off to them for um, funding infrastructure projects. Um, you know, in the device space and beyond That's in digital great. access. And then lastly, uh, focus on um, strengthening community organizations that invest in digital literacy and thinking about how that might happen in local communities. Um, so I thank everyone in our uh, great government for sharing. Let's uh, stop sharing. And now let's go uh, to breakout room two with Lauren Turner. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. I'm having some technical difficulties, so I cannot share my screen. Um, but it was an amazing conversation, an amazing group of professionals who work in this space, who had so many great things to say, um, and just learning what organizations they work for and what they do in this space. It's all part of the conversation, and it's very important. Um, we, we had Hannah in the room and Kate. Uh, we had Pierrette from the Patterson Foundation. We had a lot of just, we had Jeanette and I'll call you all out. <laughs> um, Maria, we had um, a lot of conversation about um, housing organizations. And interestingly enough, I found uh, one of the biggest takeaways, at least for me, uh, was hearing about um, accessing teletherapy and telehealth services for those who don't have a safe place to do it. And how are we going to address that? Um, was a big thing. And, and where's that funding going to come through, uh, come from, come through. And um, we talked about our, the library programs. We heard a lot from Hannah about what NAMI's doing in that regard um, and how folks who might just not have the accessibility, accessibility is huge. Um, that was a big topic um, in the breakout room uh, that we had. And it's, it's an important topic and we need to all continue our wonderful work doing that. Um, so thank you to Breakout Room 2. It was great. All of you had wonderful things to say. Um, and we will, this is just great, great work that everyone's doing. So thanks, Michael. Thank you, Lauren. And now to uh, Breakout Room 3 with uh, uh, Maribel Martinez. Uh, Maribel, maybe you could share more about what was discussed in your room. You got it, Michael. Here we go. So I, I'm not sure if this was intentional, but we did have a wonderful coming together of people who were deeply connected to both the tribal and the immigrant community. So as a result, as you can see, uh, the folks who were joining me there in breakout room three, um, they come from different sectors, but they were all very much interested in understanding and being able to do more for the tribal community. And so one of the things that um, Vineet brought up, which was, I think, such a wonderful analysis was, despite the fact that these groups can sort of all be lumped together, right? You know, we have people who are unconnected and, and they're just one big group of people. But if we really take that apart 
Um, let's say we have, you know, a segment of immigrants or tribal folks or refugees. Yes, uh, we do have immigrants uh, all over the country. And, and of course, we're a nation of immigrants. But the immigrant experience in Arizona may be quite different than the immigrant experience in Miami. And then it also based on what nation they're hailing from. So it is quite the challenge to be able to implement, I think, broad stroke type programs when it comes to connecting people, just people in general, but especially um, these groups. We also had a nice conversation uh, Vineeth brought up, uh, which I think is, is incredibly to keep in mind, and, and that is you know, cultural sensitivity. So I think, um, especially where foundations are local, they can help us not only to broker introductions, but also to help us better understand in the cases of foundations you know, who work in this particular area, to be able to get those entry points into these communities, because as we know, um, conversations with these communities have to take place in ways that respect their structure, uh, but that also, uh, also respects their, for example, their primary language um, and any cultural mores that, that need to be looked at. The other thing that we talked about, and this was just as we were closing was, and, and these are my thoughts, but just in synthesizing everything that was said in the room about the different populations that need to be served, specifically with telehealth, um, because we know that tribal populations, for instance, are spread out across large swaths of areas. And we also know that immigrants are in just about every type of community, rural, suburban, urban. So what does that look like? You know, why is telehealth not being more widely implemented there and, and how can funders support? I think funders can help broker relationships, as I said earlier, but I, I urge you to think about and, and take a look at how the Patterson Foundation goes beyond the check. I know that uh, if you look at Michael Zimmerman's uh, National Philanthropy Scan Report, which was placed in the chat, you'll see that up until the year 2020, only 0.04% of overall dollars were dedicated to digital access. And of course that's changed quite a bit, maybe not as much as we would expect or hope, but we can go beyond the check. I'll tell you that as someone who's been in the digital inclusion, in, in the digital inclusion community for about eight years now, hyperlocal programming solve local problems. Um, we, we can't say to ourselves, uh, as Vineeth very clearly said, uh, let, let's connect all tribes across the country. It doesn't work that way. Each tribe is very different. They have um, different levels of self-governance and, and those structures need to be respected. And he came up with a great example. Uh, actually, he talked about a great example of how it had to, uh, it took uh, the, the role of, of the state head. Uh, so it took the governor to be able to write a letter to the head of that tribe and you know to sort of broker those conversations from nation head to nation head essentially so the head of the state you know with with the head of the tribe and so that was how they were able to sort of move forward i i love that example and i think it's something that we could all take away and and apply practically immunities because even though we may not be dealing with communities who have you know, presidents or anything like that. Uh, there, there is a structure there, and there are ways of doing things. And unless you are a trusted community member or someone that comes in and becomes trusted, um, you know that that has to happen uh, with with experience and just with a lot of respect. So, thank you so much for all of your comments. We definitely didn't have enough time, Michael. So I'm just going to say that we need more time to be able to talk about this. But I hope that these insights were valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Maribel. Absolutely, they are. And so in the remaining uh, seven or so minutes that we have, we want to move right into our Q&A uh, because this will give everyone an opportunity just to have some concluding questions um, or comments to share uh, with our workshop here. While we're doing that, we're going to drop in the chat a link and we ask each of you to click on that link. It'll take you about a minute to do that. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, ask you to just complete our after action survey. Uh, again, it should be 30 seconds to a minute there. We want to just gain some insight into, uh, you know, how you felt uh, this went and if uh, this was helpful to you and um, if you have any suggestions for us. So by all means, please click that link uh, while we're doing our Q&A. Let's move right into Q&A and we'll use our uh, raise hand uh, feature here or you can, um, yeah, let's use the raise hand feature. 
so I can uh, see everyone. And let's also get our full gallery view here so we can see everyone. Okay, wonderful. Um, so uh, does anyone have any questions? Hey, Michael, can I give a tip? Yeah. While people formulate questions. So, so folks, um, while you guys formulate questions, it is really, 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 really important for all of you to get to know who your broadband director is. Every broadband office and every broadband director is knee deep in developing the state's first five-year plan and digital equity plan. That's gonna involve a tremendous amount of feedback and stakeholder engagement from not only proactive stakeholder engagement from, from our offices to the community, but typically the broadband office in every state is gonna be a really small office, anywhere from three to five FTEs, employees. So be proactive in reaching out, as Michael Tipton said, be proactive in reaching out to your broadband directors and say, hey, you know, we think we can be helpful to do this for you. Or here are some considerations to addressing this challenge. Because if you can help accelerate the knowledge gap that broadband offices have in understanding how you're addressing the digital divide, specifically the healthcare digital divide, um, it'll be immensely beneficial to folks like us. Appreciate it. Robin Hickey here with a question. Yes, Robin. Robin. Uh, this initially, when I joined in, and thank you, this has been a great panel, great discussion, very relevant. Schools are where children are, correct. And what that person was trying to do was direct the efforts we're making in digital literacy through the school. That is what I believe is very important and not to be underestimated. Our program, our software program only works with schools and potential external community partnerships. So I would love to join in in that effort. And if there's um, a specific person or contact, please email me or, or uh, put it in the chat because that uh, keeps education working. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, and nice that uh a connection might be able to be made there. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, any thoughts, comments, questions about maybe some themes that came up in your breakout rooms or questions for our panelists while we have them? Yes. Uh, oh, Michael Tipton. Yeah, I'll just share two quick thoughts that I wouldn't want people not hearing. So one, um, there's an interesting phenomenon I, I think we tend to associate telehealth use directly with broadband access. Um, that is true. Obviously, if you don't have internet, you may not use it. Um, but there's also an increasing correlation between if your doctor encourages you to use telehealth, then you use telehealth. So having a provider who wants you to use it is one of the key driving factors. So just something to keep in mind that this may not be as simple a, a formula of create the access. You need a doctor who's saying, hey, this is a good tool for us. Um, the other thing to say is, I think the use cases of this become sizable. So you could imagine, and in fact, there are some great pilots across the country of ways in which healthcare providers are talking to each other via telehealth. So remote consultation in ways that save uh, time, energy, increase effectiveness uh, for actual patient care, uh, that can be really powerful. So just two other examples of where, when you have the right structure in place, it could make a difference in people's lives. Thank you, Michael. So we have about two more minutes for one more question or, or comment or... I have a comment. Yes, Danielle, please. Yeah, so I was thinking about this and I came up in our, um, our group as well. And it's about like the funding process and who helps others and that sort of thing in local organizations. And I feel like a lot of the times funders they fund organizations that they have traditionally funded before. But 
if we go to that, if we think about that in that route, if that worked, we wouldn't be in the situation that we are currently in. So I think it's really important for funders to think outside of the box and fund new organizations, fund local organizations, and maybe to get together with each other or, or separately and find an organization that maybe creates some kind of database of, of of local organizations that are reliable and dependable and use those organizations to then fund or collaborate with versus funding traditional organizations. Because we all have that ability, we all org know orgs that do these things and work directly with the community. And it's important not to keep brokering a relationship that brokers another relationship. Like we need to fund these, these organizations that work directly with people so that they can then grow in their own capacity and expand on the work that they're doing. Yeah. Danielle, thank you. I, I think that's invaluable. And um, and and I certainly hope that funders are considering who are the viable partners and communities that are going to address these problems and be at the forefront of that. So we are um, right at um, almost at time here. We're gonna uh, have some concluding remarks from uh, the Patterson Foundation's Digital Access for All initiative lead um, and manager, Sherry Courier. I want to just thank our panelists uh, for joining us. And, um, and it's been a pleasure to um, hear so many ideas flowing from everyone. But let me save that for Sherry. She's about to say more about all of that. But thank you all. And Sherry Courier, please. Hi, all. If my mic is working, can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Apologies to um, breakout room four. My mic would not work. And let me say they were so brave and came through without me just being on there. And thank you, Michael, for jumping in. That's what happens when technology comes around. So uh, we would like to close out thanking all of you very quickly to remind you that um, with our wonderful presenters today. We want to thank Hannah, Vanith, and Michael for being here. Um, the topic telehealth and teletherapy. Um, we do also have a local and regional project we're working on that Lauren Turner, who you've met here, is leading with the Patterson Foundation. And we have a survey here as well. It will end up being in your follow-up. So if you can take it then, that would be great. But we also want to remind you of the next series that we're having. And on our next slide, it shows you um, exactly what that is about because all of our series are focused on digital access. And the next one in our workshop series number five will be about data, how important data is, how can funders unearth the data around digital access needs. And in some of the breakout groups, we heard some things, I thought some of the most interesting things about it's really not necessarily the same about, you know, funding devices. It's really making sure that people have access now. And so this data is really going to be helpful. It's April the 4th, 1230 to 145 in this same slot. You can use this QR code to go ahead and register. You can always go onto our site and register. And we want to, again, thank the campaign for grade level reading for helping to sponsor and co-sponsor, co-host these in their funder to funder conversation. If you like what you've heard and you wanna to continue to work with these workshop series and we go to our next slide, we just wanna let you know that the Patterson Foundation has many ways you can follow us. These are the ways that you can follow all the initiatives, but especially what's been working on in the National Philanthropy Scan under Digital Access for All. And with that, we would really like to thank all of you for being here today. We want to thank our presenters again. We want to make sure that we're providing effective and quality programming. And with that, I love the fact that I can say we're finishing two minutes early and we're giving you a gift of time back for the day. Thank you so much to everyone. Have a great rest of your week. <laughs>